when we are looking for mentors, what sort of other things that you, in your personal opinion, we should look for? Is it somebody that is where we want to be? And should we have different mentors for different things? Absolutely, yes. We, we talk about building a personal advisory board. And so that means you might have a mentor whose sole reason for being is that they're one of your greatest cheerleaders. They're just someone who's always there to go, you know, yeah, you're doing a great job. This looks fantastic. Yes, totally. And maybe giving you a little nudge or steer in the right direction. But broadly, they're there to be your greatest fan. When you do find a mentor who is streets ahead of you and super, super successful, they can have some wonderful insight, obviously, but sometimes the best kind of nuance comes from people who are still grappling with the same stuff that you're grappling with. Asking for help is kind of a superpower and it can be really easy to not ask for help and to try and work it out all yourself. But every conversation adds a little bit of perspective. Every conversation adds a little bit of enlightenment. So the more you can overcome any natural disinclination you might have to ask someone to help you, the better, the more successful you'll be. Lucy, welcome to the Career Confidence Podcast today. I'm really excited to have you on. I've been following you on LinkedIn for a while now, and uh, I know this conversation is going to be full of depth value for the listeners today. So, Just to kick off, could you give a quick introduction into who you are, Mentor Loop, your journey? It's a fantastic idea, product, service. So I'd love to hear more about how that came about. So over to you. What brought you here today and your background? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Georgie. And thanks for having me. Uh, So my name is Lucy Lloyd. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Mentor Loop. So Mentor Loop is a software platform that helps organizations build a mentoring culture. So it's kind of like almost like an internal dating site for mentoring in organizations, be they corporates, uh, industry bodies, universities. We have a lot of different customers that we work with. Uh, But my background before Mentor Loop, um, my career then was in project management, uh, in particular project and product management for digital projects, including kind of websites cloud-based uh, software platforms, digital campaigns. And my last real job uh, before we went full-time on Mentor Loop in 2016, uh, my last real job was as digital director of an advertising agency. Wow. So I want to go back first and foremost to your early career because I can imagine that project services, digital experience has really set you up for success, that technology sort of background and understanding Talk to me about like, because look, what part of my mission is to really encourage more females to pursue careers in technology, project services, like there's so many opportunities. So talk to me about why you sort of, got, how you got into that place in the, how that you sort of got into that industry in the first place and what you learned through that sort of career journey before you started Mental Loop. Sure. I, um, I, Basically, at university, I studied economics and French, which equipped me for almost nothing, you know. Um, <laughs> so I briefly went into uh, to government, to public service. Um, but then I, you know, had met a boy while traveling and decided to move to London to, to, to pursue that with him. Um, and in moving to London, I kind of just fell into the digital scene. So I worked for agencies that helped bars and restaurants actually, um, build their own digital presence. So it was kind of just when Google maps was launching, it was kind of early days of search engine optimization, um, things like that. So I had this great broad kind of grounding in how to present your brand and your business on the internet. Uh, and yeah, it is kind of, and it was a lot of client-based work as well, you know, managing multiple clients and helping them achieve the most. And so you were just, I was just exposed to a lot of different stuff. Um, and yeah, as I say, like Google Maps launched while I was kind of, you know, working with bars and restaurants. So getting a strategy for how, you know, something that's so embedded in in the way you market your business now, it was brand new then. Uh, so that gave me a great grounding in, um, I guess, the digital. And so when I say digital, I kind of mean anything cloud-based. So it could be digital marketing, but also, you know, building apps on the cloud that help you uh, reach your customers, process your customers, you know, build better business processes, things like that. So I had that great grounding, then moved back to Melbourne, um, where the, the digital industry was a little bit more fragmented and it was kind of a little bit more difficult to navigate. But um, that, yeah, that, that experience took me in good stead to, um, to, yeah, join, uh, eventually an advertising agency and become their digital director. Incredible. 
God, thank God for Google Maps. All I say, I don't know where I'd be without that. I'd be yeah. uh, totally lost in the middle of nowhere, so, 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 but I can't even imagine my life w- without that. But look, it's, it's been a real journey, hasn't it? And I, I arrived in Melbourne um, 12 years ago now, and the the advancements in technology in that time have been insane. It's, it's really, really exciting to see. But one thing you touched upon there, which I think is really important, is the whole brand piece. I think that's where companies really fall short. So when you started... Like, like mental loop, like obviously with that digital background, understanding how important that was, like w- was that sort of your responsibility in those sort of really early days when the the business was sort of starting out? Do you think like that sort of helped you with those sort of transferable skills, really pitch mental loop and really understand why the brand and what you were creating was just so important? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, look, we didn't spend a lot of time on brand, to be honest. Um, the brand at that point was my my startup mental loop with a co-founder. So there's two of us. And the brand at that point was, you know, more just an extension of our personalities. You know, we we decided to start the business um, through a personal need that we'd felt. Um, and we wanted to pitch it in a way that was uh, kind of corporate friendly, but maybe maybe a little bit on the casual end of corporate friendly. And really, like we just needed a name at, at the, in the early days. And there used to be like these web 2.0 name generators where you could put a concept in and then it would spit out all these options. And Mentor Loop was one of the options that it spat out. And that was great for us because before we called it Mentor Loop, we were just kind of calling it our project, you know, or the, or the thing. And so putting a name on it for yourself, um, you know, that really legitimizes it in your own mind. It legitimizes it when you talk to people like friends and family about what so that was super important. And then also having the word mentor in the name was critical for, it's just so good for search engine optimization and for, uh, you know, customer kind of, I guess, understanding of what you do. You know, there's, there's a shortcut to them knowing what you're offering them before you actually, you know, get into uh, your first conversations where if you go for a more abstract name, you know, which might be cool, um, it, yeah, it, it takes a little bit more time to educate your customer on what you do. Mm. One piece of advice that I got once was make sure that your business name is really simple to sort of understand. It almost like explains it in the name, unless, you know, you are really going to put in a lot of time and energy into your marketing. You know, I think yeah, that's, that's sort right. of really key, especially for a service-based business as well. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to be a sexy name. And I think that's probably where a lot of entrepreneurs probably go quite wrong as they spend so long on the brand, the logo, the name, and actually not actually the service and the product they're trying to create. So it's really interesting that that was sort of your journey as well. But you just said something really interesting there. You said it was a need with you and your co-founder. So why why was it a need? Like what, what sort of sparked the idea? You obviously sort of felt something when you're working in, you know, the corporate and the digital space. Why did you and your co-founder come together to create it? Sure. So we, we were, before we were co-founders, we, we were friends and, and we mm-hmm. still are friends. Um, and we uh, were having a glass of wine together probably about like 10 to 12 years ago now because we had the idea a long time before we did anything about it or before we went full time anyway. Um, And so we were having a glass of wine and both discussing our own careers and and Heidi had had a previous tech business um, that she was working on. I was in the tech industry and both of us had felt that, I guess, that feeling of being on the periphery of a a new industry and not, not not knowing what you don't know essentially. And so, you know, imagine if you could find someone who was a future version of yourself who could take you by the hand and just help you navigate, you know, the, the steps to actually become embedded in that industry. And we thought, you know, if, if LinkedIn optimized for quality over con- quantity, that, that's kind of what we were talking about. And, you know, we were like, well, we're really talking about mentoring. And so we would felt the need for it ourselves. Um, and we thought, okay, well, like a dating site for mentoring. But then we started speaking to um, people who were up to their elbows in mentoring already. So universities, corporate HR, anyone who was running mentoring programs. And we very quickly saw that they had this need, which was a software platform to make mentoring more scalable, more accessible, um, and more kind of predictably high quality in their organizations. And so we're like, okay, well, that's our customer. That's what we need to build for. Um, and, and that kind of, yeah, it, everything kind of led from there. Mm. You talked about before the mentoring culture, Um, I wouldn't say that's a culture I've ever worked in before. So how do you define a mentoring culture? What does that mean to you? What does that look like? Yeah, and it's there's very few organizations that that have an embedded mentoring culture. And so when we say mentoring culture, we mean it's something that's part of the fabric of an organization. It's always on. 
always accessible. As soon as you join that organization, you're plugged into the mentoring network to find you know, the people that can help you with whatever you're working on at that time. But that's not how our customers start. Generally, our customers will start where they're running a particular program and it might be for you know a, a particular purpose, for example, women in leadership in their organization. And so they start small, they start with kind of more control over the, the audience and the outcomes. And then over time, we kind of coach them and show them how easy it is to use a software platform like Mentor Loop to actually scale that beyond just that first audience to, to make it, you know, something that's available to everyone in their organization. Okay. Look, I absolutely love the idea. I think it is so important. Like if I reflect back on my career, I wouldn't be where I am today without help of certain individuals. But I think that one thing that I've always, always probably thought about when it comes to mentoring is it's, you kind of want, almost want like gamify. You want, you want your mentor to say, right, Georgie, this is what I want you to do this week. And then I go away and do it. And then almost like have like a tick box exercise, like that's what I've done and, and sort of see your progress over time. So is that sort of, I'd love to learn, know more about the, the product itself and how it actually makes mentoring more tangible and feel more scalable, um, for, for people. Yeah, and that, that that is largely, I guess it starts even before that that matching point, you know, because you need mentors and mentees to think beyond just the participation. Um, and so when you ask a population, you know, do you want to be in the mentoring program? And a lot of them will say, yeah, that'd be nice, thank you. Uh, because that mentoring, you know, has this, I guess, a positive kind of, you know, feeling around it. But really, you need to scratch below the surface there. And so a big part of what Mental Loop does is actually ask people a couple of different times and in a couple of different ways, like, what are you really here for? You know, what do you mm. want to achieve? Why mentoring? Why now? What's the, you know, what's this next milestone you're looking at in your career, et cetera? So a lot of the setup or a lot of what Mental Loop does is creates conditions for great mentoring connections to happen by asking people a series of questions and collecting enough data on them to, you know, uh, deliver recommended matches that will help them achieve their goals, not just recommended matches based on who who looks fun, you know, or who looks like someone aspirational for them. Because I think we all think, you know, Oprah would be a great mentor <laughs> for me. You know, she's achieved so much, but actually what are you trying to achieve this week, you know, this month, this year? What are your kind of short and long-term goals? Um, and that's that's how we build great matches, you know. And the benefit of that also is that you kind of move away from, demographics um, and psychographics being the way that you match and you match based more on outcomes. And that gives a really clear kind of, uh, I guess, roadmap to the mentor and mentee in their relationship because they know what they're there to achieve. So the platform itself helps nudge mentors and mentees into great mentoring behaviours. It gives them a framework in the form of kind of a series of milestones that they move through together and it helps them to set goals for the relationship too. And some experienced mentors and, and experienced mentees don't need any of that stuff, but really it's just there. It's this helping hand that can help them to, you know, to, to build the best possible mentor relationship. I absolutely love that. And if I was sort of reflect, so I think what, what people tend to do is they look at, like you said there, Oprah, <laughs> as an example, they look at these people that have achieved so much, but what that's sort of in danger of doing is not making it tangible, making it seem really unrealistic and almost sort of like the goalposts feel so far away that you start to then feel really demotivated. It's like, I'm never going to be as successful as that person. I'm never going to be like that person. So actually I love what you're doing is it's very much more like, goal orientated and you know I believe you can't be what you can't see so if you yeah. see somebody else doing it and you go how have you done it like I believe success leaves clues so if you can help people and pull people with you and just give them the tools and the strategies and the lessons that you've learned that's so empowering to the other individual and I just think you know what you've created is is really really important and it's especially for you know the the people that are sort of like up and coming the younger generations and and also to give back that sort of purpose for those that have achieved a lot in their career and now want to give back but also don't necessarily just want to you know just dish out information willy-nilly they want to actually work with people that they know they can actually have an impact on so I just absolutely. absolutely love the context, but you've, you've sort of touched upon it a little bit, but when we are looking for mentors, 
what sort of other things that you, in your personal opinion, we should look for? Like, is it somebody that is where we want to be? And, 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 and should we have different mentors for different things? So for example, like for health, for relationships, like, you know, are we sort of trying to set the bar too high by focusing on getting just one more, one mentor for our, for our whole lives? Yeah, and to answer that most recent question, absolutely, yes. We we talk about building a personal advisory board. And so that means, yeah, you might have a mentor whose who's sole, you know, reason for being is that they're one of your greatest cheerleaders, you know. They're just someone who's always there to go, you know, yeah, you're doing a great job. This looks fantastic. Yes, totally. And maybe giving you a little nudge or steer in the right direction. But but broadly, they're there to, you know, be your greatest fan. Um, but I, I personally have other mentors for specific things. And so I have like a legal stuff mentor. So it's, they're not our lawyer, although sometimes it does turn into, you know, in a, a formal engagement. But just if I have a legal question or we're grappling with something that then needs to be considered, um, then I'll, I'll call on them. And so, and I have peer mentors as well. And so that's the other thing is like, when you do find a mentor who is, I guess, streets ahead of you um, and super, super successful, they can have some wonderful insight, obviously, but sometimes the, the the best kind of nuance comes from people who are still grappling with the same stuff that you're grappling with, or they only solved it last week, you know, they didn't solve it five years ago. Because, you know, I think peer mentoring is now one of the most um, rewarding things that I get involved in. And I've got, you know, certain other business founders and, you know, things, and even friends, you know, that I go to with, with something that I'm grappling with. So I think that, you know, particularly starting a business, but really for anyone asking for help is kind of a superpower oh, and it can be really easy to not ask for help and to try and work it out all yourself. But, you know, every, every conversation adds a little bit of perspective. Every conversation adds a little bit of enlightenment. And, and so, you know, the more you can kind of, I guess, overcome any natural, you know, disinclination you might have to ask someone to help you, um, the better, more successful you'll be. I completely agree. And when I reflect on my own career and business journey, it's been the times where I've asked for help that I've had the biggest wins and the times where I've like kind of gone away and tried to figure it out myself I've made more mistakes felt got myself more into a hole and then but then you speak to someone you go oh god I wish I had done this sooner it's always yeah. the first thought I was like, why didn't I just ask for help like you know it's, there's no shame in you know you don't know what you don't know at the end of the day yeah. and god I if I, if I reflect on all the mistakes that I've made across the course of my career and my business, I, I could probably fill a book. So it, now I am so much more intentional with wisdom on my shoulders, like to sort of say, okay, who has been there and done it? Yeah. What are the lessons and mistakes they've learned? How can I avoid that and fast track where I want to go? And I always sort of think back, you know, if I wanted to climb Everest, for example, I wouldn't just pack a rucksack and off I go. There would be so many things that I would you know, want to know and, and I'd have to have coaching around it and mentorship around it. So it's just so important. So yeah, I really do think like the biggest sort of takeaway from, from this conversation right now is don't ask for help, get a mentor and just make sure that, you know, it's somebody that, you know, is where you want to be maybe a few steps ahead, but also not too many steps ahead because yeah. maybe as well, what I found is that they're almost out of touch. And they kind of like almost forget what it's like. <laughs> well, they have this kind of success bias, you know, yes. which is that every decision they made was the right decision. And that, that's, a, that's a gross generalization. Mm. Not everybody's like that. But when, you know, when you're grappling with something, you know, there's at least five different paths you could go down. And, you know, they're all still really vital to you. But the longer you get past that, the path you went down and the one that was successful for you was the only one to take, you know. Mm. So you, don't, you kind of lose that perspective over time and you just think, oh, yeah you know, I made the right call every single time. Um, and so I think, yeah, the closer you are to the mistakes or the potential, you know, missteps that you made, the more valuable you are to as a mentor. I completely agree. So look, you've, you've had an incredible journey. Um, you know, Mentor Loop is obviously, it's, it's a fantastic product. It's doing incredible things. I'd love to sort of go back to sort of those like early days. Because one thing I am always fascinated when I meet entrepreneurs and business owners is your mindset like how you know on the days where you sort of maybe start questioning yourself what have I done there's easier things to be doing with my life like what do you personally do Lucy to keep yourself disciplined to keep going and you know on those days where you are struggling how do you push through and keep on focusing on the mission and the goals 
So a couple of things. I think, um, you know, an extension of that ask for help thing is is if you're going to start something or you are doing something a bit ambitious, try not to do it alone. Um, so I do it with my my co-founder, Heidi. And, you know, if if she's up and I'm down, we balance each other out. If, if I'm up, she's down, et cetera. And so we together create this drumbeat and the drumbeat doesn't just have to come from you. And so that's, that's super important. Um, I, I think the other thing, a couple of things is, you know, you are often just, <laughs> excuse the expression, but eating crap all day long when you're starting a business in the early days. You know, everyone's saying no to you. You can't get anywhere and it does often, often more often than not, feel pretty hopeless. Uh, so having a North Star that you're working towards, um, but not just the North Star, but the kind of strategic, I guess, dominoes that need to fall to get that North Star is really important. And so for us, we might have a North Star being, you know, the number one global mentoring platform in the world. Um, but we, you know, you bite off uh, smaller chunks of that to to start with. And so our first kind of, you know, big goal that we were working towards was just a certain revenue number per month that we were making, you know, and we would zero, have hyper focus on that. Like when you start something, you often do just like chase every possible idea, possible opportunity down every possible rabbit hole. Whereas if you define that kind of short term goal, so in three months, we're going to be doing this revenue then you can really easily start to uh, evaluate those decision points based on on what's going to get you to that quickest. And so for us, when we first started, you know, people heard that we'd started a software company and they'd say, look, my nephew's actually doing, you know, a computer science degree and he'd love to build your app. You know, do you need him to build your app? And, you know, we kind of like, oh yeah, free app development, but really like, is it going to get us to this particular revenue point at this particular time? No, it's not. So no, jettison that, you know, we'll we'll look at that down the track. So I think you do have to kind of, you know, you need to set short-term goals and be ruthless about, about you know, decision-making that gets you to those goals. And then the last thing I'd probably say about motivation is is kind of your cultural values. And I think um, Hyde and I, my co-founder and I, were, were a bit sceptical about cultural values because we'd seen them used in um, corporate, you know, environments where it's always like agility and honesty and transparency and, you know, you, they're kind of very, I don't know, abstract and far removed from a person's, you know, day to day. Um, and so we were quite intentional about defining our values um, and uh, sharing them with the team and, ev- and evolving them with the team as well. And it is something that we do embed in our business. So they're kind of a great way to evaluate, you know, people that we're hiring and to evaluate, you know, how we're doing as a team and how we're working together. But it's also, they're also motivating in the sense that, you know, you, if you're at, I guess, again, a decision point can be paralyzing. So if you're at that point where you you don't know which way to go, then you've actually got a, a cheat sheet for how you should make that decision. Mm. Some really, really solid advice. And the, there's, a, there's a key thing that I wanted to um, pull out there because I completely agree with you. It's choosing your business partner wisely. <laughs> and uh, myself and my business partner, Pam, who is also my best friend, we went yeah. into business together. And a bit like you, Lucy, we were sat in Bali after a, a holiday and we were just having a few gins and we just decided that we could both totally run our own business and we backed yeah. each other 100%. But you're so right. Whenever Pam's having a bit of a wobbly moment, I'm back. I'm there to balance her out and vice versa. So picking those co-founders is so important. And I don't know about you, but for me, I always, I think what Pam and I have done really well over the years is we've always put our friendship above business. And I think that's so important because of course there's days where the, where the stakes are high, there's pressure, but I always come back to, well, I always go future forward 10 years from now. How do I want to look back on this moment? What's actually going to matter when I'm old and gray on my deathbed? It's not going to be, oh, I grew that great business and I made a ton of money and look at all the success I've had. It's actually going to be, who was I as a person? Who did I have around me? What are, what are the quality of my relationships? That is the thing that matters most to me above all else. And I think that's why after six years, we're still in business. We're still the best of friends and we're still having tons of fun building Seed Solutions and now Sister Club. So yeah, yeah I'm sure you've got a lot to say about why choosing your co-founder is so important. But just, just one final thing on that is like, how do you and Heidi like deal with things? Like if, do you have ever have, have you gone about having disagreements and how have you dealt with that um, throughout the last sort of like, you know, 10 or so years? 
I think um, we're we're lucky in that we are both very. I guess we're not afraid to to have hard conversations, um, and mm-hmm. we might just create, I guess, an, an environment where we can that where we've lowered the stakes slightly. And so mainly what I'm talking about is we go to the pub. Um, so if we do have to have a conversation that is, you know, a bit sensitive, we'll take ourselves out of yes. the environment that's kind of causing the issue and we'll go to the pub or we'll go for a walk and we'll kind of nut it out between it. Um, but where, you know, where we probably had the most, uh, and, you know, it's not even disagreement, but where we were most uncomfortable with what we were doing was when we were making the decision whether or not to go full-time on Mentor Loop. Um, and so we'd been doing it part, like part time around everything else, you know, each of us able to commit a different amount of different, you know, different amount of time over that kind of three years where we were doing it on the side of, of our, you know, full time jobs. Um, and we were getting to this point of kind of like, is this a thing? Isn't this a thing? You know, we've got a few customers, we've got some money being paid, you know signs are looking good, but how do we make that decision? Um, and so in that moment, we, took the decision out of ourselves. So it wasn't just about our emotions and our feelings. It was like, okay, what's an external validation point we can use to prove to ourselves that this is worth doing and it's worth going all. And for us, that external validation point was, okay, can we, using the traction that we've shown, the the, the, the process, you know, the, the uh, progress that we've made so far as a business, if we can raise a certain amount of money and basically, you know, enough money to pay us full time for, for a year and, you know, um, get a better product developed, et cetera, if we can raise that particular amount of money, um, then that's the trigger that that sends us full time. And so it was, it gave us something to focus on, which wasn't just the emotional kind of, you know, uh, ebb and flow of should we, shouldn't we, you know, one of us would be yes, the other one it wouldn't be at a different time. So having that external validation point to settle things where you are on the fence is really important. I completely agree. And I think it's always, again, just checking in with each other, making sure you're on the same page, making sure you want the same things. That's that's super important. You know, for example, Pam's got two young children. I don't have children. So I can work a lot more than what Pam can sometimes. And that, that's been a sort of a journey for us both to go on as well, because, you know, sometimes it's like, I'm working, she's not, she can feel a bit guilty about that. And it's like, no, look, you know, we've all got our own values. And I think that's the thing. It's like you're individuals and you've got the same mission, but you've also kind of got slightly different values. And it's just making sure that her values are aligned, my values are aligned, but we've always supported each other. And I think that's obviously sounds like what you and Heidi have done as well, which is really beautiful to hear. Um, Yeah. Just on that, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but on that, I think as women in particular, you need to absolutely be upfront about that stuff with each other. You know, if you're two women co-founding a business together, then it's kind of like, okay, here's where I am. You know, just to, just acknowledge the fact that there are differences um, yeah. and that it's it's tough, you know. Like we'd love to live in this ideal world where women aren't shouldering, you know, overwhelmingly most of the, the kind of at-home burden, particularly when there are children involved, um, but we don't live in that world. So, you know, we've just got to be upfront about it you know, I'm sure women are building the most uh, women-friendly businesses in the world, but there's still practicalities that you've got to take into account and and you've got to be upfront with each other about, you know, just think about what does the 10 years, next 10 years look like? How many, how much, how long can I be running this business? When will you need to step in and run this business? And I think that's something that that we've done really well is is, um, uh, exchange (laughs) command, you know, um, and, and step in and and run it at different times because, uh, yeah, you know, life will kind of come along and, and necessitate, you know, you needing to take some time out of the business. And it's so important to keep that drumbeat going. Mm, that's such that's such solid advice and I just want to go back to the the raise because that's I think that's going to be just probably some nuggets of gold in there what was that process like uh because you know look the the stats do show that not many women you know there's not many women founders there's not many women CEOs there's not even many women in c-suites and there's very little women getting invested in so what was that process like of pitching and raising capital yeah, we we kind of ran our own process because we we couldn't really get the traction that we wanted to with the accepted process, you know. Um, which normally, you know, you'd take your business to a big fund and and they'd say, "Yeah, we're going to lead your funding round," and uh, then a few other people might jump on board. We could never kind of get that conviction from the big investor, but we had a lot of conversations, you know, like hundreds of conversations, and we had you know a number of people who were interested enough to 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 have a little bit of a you know a go with Mentor Loop, and so we ended up running what we call a party round. So it was 
uh, a few different investors at various different, you know, amounts that they put in. And as I mentioned, we kind of gave ourselves a minimum or like if we can get to this amount, then we're going all in. Um, and that was, that minimum was 250 grand back then. Uh, and then we, you know, over a couple of rounds, again, always party rounds, we, we raised about 1.75 million US, uh, sorry, Australian. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that was over a couple of different funding rounds. So it's not, it's not huge money by, you know, the, I guess there's a lot of press around raises, you know, particularly in the tech industry. And so ours certainly wasn't a huge round, um, uh, by those, you know, newspaper standards. Uh, but it was uh, enough money for us to uh, build a great version of our product, to uh, build a sustainable business. So our business is now profitable. Um, so we we self fund our, our development now, uh, and and you know we also have some fantastic investors involved with Mentor Loop who are mentors as well to us. You know we can go to them when we've got particular questions or problems or, or things we're trying to achieve because you know many of them are. are, are amazingly successful business people in their own right incredible look and congratulations like 1.7 million is fantastic and the fact that you're now actually profitable that's that's ultimately the goal right you don't just want to keep on relying on money coming in from investors and giving away more Absolutely. and more of your company like you actually want to build a company that's making money otherwise you don't have a business as far as I'm concerned if you're relying on external investment um so I think that's really honorable and incredibly inspiring um but you, you spoke about it in the beginning about the whole hiring piece and getting that right and look that is just so important especially when you're a small business the first sort of like 10 high that could absolutely make or break your business and ultimately determine the culture moving forward. So I'd love to learn more about like how you've gone about hiring, what you look for when building out a team and how it is really important sort of from those sort of small businesses to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and look, I mean, I think our biggest learning from a hiring perspective was kind of pretty much our first employee and um, needing to move them on after six months because we just hadn't find their role well enough. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of came to us and we're like, yep, we see you've raised some money. I can do this, this and this. I'd love to work for Mental Loop. I love the vision, you know, it resonates with me. And we're like, oh my God, you know, someone actually wants to work for us. Uh, <laughs> let's get them on board as soon yeah. as possible. And then that didn't work out. And it was very much our bad that it didn't work out. You know, we hadn't define the role properly. We hadn't set that person up for success. And so we're like, okay, we need, we, we thought we were people, people, you know, we know how to talk to people. That'll be an easy part of the business, but no. So then we very quickly upskilled. We spoke to again, mentors, peer mentors, uh, we recommended a few books and eventually came with some, a methodology called top grading to run our, um, our interview process. And the main, you know, the top grading is quite, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to it, but the main takeaway we got from it was just consistency in the process that you run for every candidate, you know, whereas we used to kind of like have, you know, a bit of a behavioral interview and then have a coffee catch up. And, you know, now we're much more, we need to make sure we're asking the same questions of every, um, every candidate, you know, we're not, there's no unconscious bias creeping into how we evaluate people. Um, we need to run a process. We need to have criteria, we need to use, et cetera, et cetera. And also an important thing that we do because we do, we're only a team of 16 now. So we run quite a, a, a rigorous uh, hiring um, process, I'd say, for, for a team of our size. There's kind of seven steps, but we have a PDF that we send, you know, when we first speak to candidates, we're like, you know, here's, here's what the next, you know, stage will look like at Mental Loop. Here's how we hire. And there's, you know, there's maybe an initial online kind of questionnaire and then there's, um, you know, a behavioral interview that there might be an exercise, then there might be kind of a meet the founders for a coffee, et cetera. And so, you know, we have this process that's rigorous, that's really well communicated and that, you know, gives the candidate confidence in, in what pro kind of process they're going into um, and also enables us to, to make clear decisions at each stage of that process too. Mm, I love that. And, and what I also love is the fact that you were just so self-aware enough to identify that, oh, this is a bit new. We don't really know what we're doing here, but you you took action and you started reading books and it just illustrates something that I've always believed of that, you know, it's the people that take action, it's the people that go for it. Like you, if you wait to have all the answers before you start something, you will never learn. And, you know, the first high, you don't always get it right. The first couple of highs don't always get it right, but you learn and you grow throughout the process and then you quickly identify what's going to work, what's not going to work. And now you've really def refined that process and you've, uh, I'm sure, got a fantastic culture. Um, 
but like in your sort of like experience, have you sort of like when you sort of started growing out that team, how have you and Heidi sort of structured, you know, because what, what Pam and I have sort of experienced over the years is one of us has had to sort of take more management. One of us is sort of like, and, and how, how have you sort of communicated like your roles in the business? Like who's responsible for team or is it both of you? Who does the team report into? How has that sort of structure evolved or has it? Is it still quite um, a flat structure? It's it's pretty flat, um, but it also, I guess, in the early days when it was just Heidi and I, we we started like a Trello board. You know, a Trello board, you can build mm-hmm. a couple of lists. Yeah. So we built a list, you know, basically we built, um, made a card for every, I guess, task or responsibility that we could see in the business. And then we dragged and dropped them into each of our lists. And then we kind of kept undertaking that that process to just define who's who's responsible for what in between the two of us. And I think that is actually a really important part of, of getting started with someone is taking the time to define responsibility rather than just kind of get a feel for it based on, you know, what each person's good at. Because if you do that, then you'll probably end up working on a lot of the same stuff. <clears throat> and that's fine. Sometimes you do have to work on the same stuff, but just being really intentional about it is the, is the point I guess I'm making. Uh, and then I, I think we are quite flat. We have a, um, a, a CTO as well as Heidi and I. So the three of us kind of run the, the various components of the business. Um, and my role is kind of product and customer. And Heidi's role is sales, really business development. And they're, you know, that it's not as clear cut as that. There's a lot more, you know, bleeding across the different uh, teams. But um, for that reason, Heidi has kind of sales and marketing under her, but I've got customer success and, and the product team and the engineers under me. So it's a, um, yeah, so that that's the way we define it by function. Um, and yeah, there is a lot of, I guess, team management involved, but but in a good way. Um, so we we both, I think every leader in our business needs to be able to manage team. You know, that's that's just, that's, yeah. That's just always going to be the case. We don't have room in the size we are for kind of superstar individual contributors. You know, we we're all we're all team players. Mm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I think that's the one thing that I'd say Pam and I have sort of really had to define is what is our role so we don't trip over each other and we're not sort Absolutely. of like oh I don't you know I would have handled that differently you know so it's just like no that's not my role in the business that's yours you take that but but obviously they're to support each other and run things past Absolutely. each other as well so that's really important look uh, one thing I wanted to sort of touch upon with you Lucy is I think like the last sort of few years from what I've I've had lots of conversations over the last few years. We've had COVID, we've gone into a tech, um, you know, recession. It, it's been uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs with, I think, sort of those smaller size, small to mid-sized businesses, e- even large um, corporates have also suffered. But it's been a really tough few years for a lot of people. And the, the sense that I'm getting from founders, from people that I work with closely is that people are just generally feeling quite exhausted and run down. Um, how have you navigated the last few years personally? You know, it, it really has been a roller coaster ride. And I'm always sort of like looking to sort of ask these questions because I think what's really important and I, what I don't want how this pod- podcast to come, come across is that we've got it all figured out. And because I think like, I know I, I know I don't, which is why I do the podcast. I want to learn from people like yourself. So how have you navigated over the last few years? And you know, come out the other side, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> like badly. Um, yeah. But that's not, I, I think, you know, yeah, as you say, like there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of pressures on everyone. I think again, having, having a co-founder helps with that. I suppose um, not necessarily huge changes in my role, but again, there's kind of that intentionality that's probably come into how I live my life. And um, I use a habit tracking app to track healthy habits that I, that I do each week. So things like you know, gym, bike rides, walks, you know, getting out in nature, um, uh, kind of even things like meal prepping, you know, I prep you know, mood food and stuff for the week. And, and I, you know, I do certain things to just make my physical self um, as, as geared for success or even just for comfort and, and health as possible. Um, and so I think over, and it may also be like turning 40 and stuff like that, but certainly over COVID, um, uh, I got a lot more intentional about that because I think what we got was, you know, we got a lot of time um, and, you know, we I was still super busy with our, with our businesses. Of course, when you're growing your business, you, you kind of never turn off from that. But there was time to actually think about what is my, you know, what is my 
regime, you know, like we, Heidi and I were both pretty old school about working from home. We were kind of like, yeah, you can do it, you know, once every fortnight or something like that. But we all come into the office. That's how we work as a business. You know, we collaborate. Uh, and we've definitely relaxed those ideas. And so we're much more easy on ourselves now than we ever were about um, about commuting and about, you know, making sure you make time for exercise in your day. So I think there's been really great benefits from it as well as, you know, obviously various lockdowns. Um, but yeah, I guess probably the the taking care of yourself physically um, and and spiritually in the sense of I do some meditation. I just make sure I get out in nature as much as possible. You know, stuff like that. I, I think, you know, learning is something that's a real turn on, you know, feeling like you're not standing still. So at the moment I'm, I'm learning to, you know, play golf or, you know, I've kind of been playing golf for a while, but I say I'm learning because I'm so bad at it. Uh, and I'm also involved kind of peripherally in some winemaking and things like that. So actually just kind of moving beyond that laser focus on on your number one. And for me, mental loops my number one, but actually kind of, you put after lockdowns, after the stress of it, just putting your head up and looking around at what else is worthwhile and interesting and matters in your life. And so that's, you know, probably quite a garbled answer. But yeah, that's where I've been spending my time. No, I think I think it's just so important because I can so easily dip into just my whole world being about work His and work. business. Yeah, absolutely. And then what I find is that then I kind of like wake up one day and then I'm resentful because I go, I've had no time for me. You know, I don't feel good. And then because I have sort of had some anxiety in the past, I'm very aware of the warning signs of I need to pull back, I need to, you know, relax. But yeah. I don't know about you, but one thing that I always it's always been a challenge for me is that sort of blend between patience and ambition, like wanting things to happen now, but also knowing that it's the consistency, it's the 1%, it's the slight edges that you do day to day that actually add up to the long-term goals. So how yeah. do you balance that goal, those goals with the patience? <laughs> yeah, that's hard one um it's uh I, and I yeah I know exactly what you mean and yeah it's it can be yeah it can be super distracting if you don't feel like you're not going fast enough and so like one thing I will say is I, I I where I am feeling maybe a bit frustrated you know I never feel patient um but where I am feeling that frustration I focus on the process not on the outcomes um and what I mean by that is if we're trying something new or going into a new market or building something new, I don't, I try not to spend my time agonizing over the things I can't control. Um, instead, I focus on what I can do and control. And, and so for us, like an example might be, you know, we're going into a new market, we're trying to land a big new deal somewhere. Um, and then uh, the deal goes into procurement. And so, you know, we, we have no insight on what's happening in the procurement side. It just goes in this black box and it might come out. We've got a customer, it may never come out, who knows? And in the, that time, it's just like, well, I can't just, there's nothing I can do to, to push that along. I can't keep harassing my contact at the the customer to say, hey, just checking in, just checking in. Um, and so what I'll do instead is I'll, I'll outreach to 50 other businesses that look the same, you know, and I'll, I'll spend my time focusing on what I can control, forging those new relationships based on what I've learned from that potential customer and trying to have 50 of the same conversations with new people. Uh, and, you know, focusing on that process and building that pipeline is is uh, much healthier than just waiting for the outcome and getting frustrated through that. The other thing that your question made me think of was during COVID, I remember um, spending a lot of time um, trying to feel grateful, you know, counting my blessings and just being like, I'm grateful for my health and I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful that I live in Australia. Isn't it wonderful that we've had the opportunity to create a business so that, you know, I can, you know, work from home during COVID and things like that. And I um, see a psychologist and I was talking to her about, you know, this gritted teeth kind of gratitude that I was going through um, each day. And she said, yeah, I think you can actually change that a bit and not just be about gratitude, but also about pride. And so it's not just being grateful for something, it's being grateful for the opportunity, but also proud of the role that you've taken in creating, you know, making that opportunity better for yourself. You know, yes, you're grateful for your family, but also proud of the work you do to, to make that family, you know, the happiest it can possibly be. And I think that tweak to my thinking, like tempering, not just counting your blessings, you know, um, uh, in a kind of 
like I guess motorized kind of way, but actually thinking about how you contribute to those blessings and, and acknowledging yourself, you know, for, for the work that you do was was a really big mindset change for me. Mm. Also super empowering as well because you go god like look at what i've actually achieved and i think that it's one thing that i probably would well, definitely didn't do enough is i never took stock it was like what's next what's next yeah what's the next goal what's the next client what's the next this and it's just that actually it you end up just not again that whole gratitude piece you end up just sort of like one day going like oh i don't feel anything anymore and i just like you know i've done all these things in my life and i'm like a little bit empty so i yeah. I, I just think like celebrating the small wins taking stock Absolutely. of where you are where you've come from and i, I heard um I heard on a podcast the other day it's like you know you 10 years ago would have looked at you now and been like wow you've made it you're so you know you're so happy and successful because 10 years ago this is exactly what you wanted when you were stuck in the corporate job and didn't have any freedom or flexibility now look at what you've accomplished and like the, the striving and the, 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 you know, the goals, they'll never end. And I think, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing to sort of want to keep getting better, but I yeah. think what, where you can sort of lose yourself and lose the joy and the fun and everything else that life has to offer is when it's just all consuming and you don't yeah. sort of check in with yourself and just have those sort of like gratitude, spiritual practices to be like, wow, well, like I am truly grateful and I'm proud and, you know, I am excited about the future, but I'm also very content and happy where I am now. And that's, it's an ongoing process for me, uh, for yep. sure. But it's something that I check in with myself on a regular basis now. No, yeah. it is. It's all a process. And yeah, as I said, like I do see a psychologist, you know, we, I've had a coach in the past, like, you know, like, again, you can ask for help, you know, like it's it's a rare person who would just do it all alone. Like it takes a village, you know, in, in many ways to, to, to get to a point where you can start business and can, mm-hmm. you know, like can run a business. Yeah, hundred percent. You see, it's been incredible chatting with you. Um, you have achieved so much. I find everything you've done extremely inspiring, and I can also relate to a lot of the things that you've gone through and you, you're speaking about as well. But what is next for you? What, where do you see Mentor Loop? Like, I know it's a big question, but you know, what would the next sort of, you know, if you could have a crystal ball and go, this is what I'd love to have happen the next five years. Like, what would that be if you've got a goal in mind that you'd like to achieve with it? Yeah, I mean, we, we're we in uh, Australia and the UK. We've got 13 people here and three in the UK. We're going into the US at the moment. So Amazing. Um, we, uh, you know, our kind of goal is to to make 1 million uh, life-changing connections happen on Mentor Loop in the next five years. Um, at the moment, we're at kind of 80,000. So to give you an idea of, of the scale that we're aiming for. Uh, so, so the US is a big part of that. And we've built a more kind of accessible version of our platform that smaller organizations can use. It doesn't cost what enterprise software would cost. And so that's kind of, there's this kind of level of scale that we're striving for and the market like the US being so large and, and um, varied is is a great one for us to to approach with that. For me personally, I mean, I, I, I think I'll be working on Mental Loop for the next five years definitely, but I, I alluded before to learning to make wine. I'm very passionate about wine. So I'm peripherally involved in, in this wine making at the moment and on the weekend, I spent a whole lot of time just tinkering with the website for that particular wine brand. And so I'd like, you know, in, in 10 years time, I'd like to be making wine um, as my as my job. And so that's an interesting, um, I guess, intellectual kind of experiment, you know, hypothesis to think through, like, how do I actually make that happen? You know, what kind of study do I do? Who do I connect with? All that stuff. And so that's a really nice kind of side hustle, you know, or not even a hustle at this point. It's just a side dream. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something I've been thinking about too. Uh, I think mentor loop is a, you know, is a love of my life. And, and I, as I say, I can definitely see myself being with mentor loop for a, a long time to come, but perhaps it'll be in a format where I can also, you know, indulge in kind of my, uh, more kind of my, my dream career, you know, that, that perfect career of, of working with wine. Love that. I love that. And, uh, Oh, I look forward to trying a bottle. So uh, <laughs> count, count me as your first customer. I love a, sure. love, a, love a little wine. Um, but listen, amazing to have you on today. Where can I send people to find out more about you, Mentor Loop, and uh, yeah, what you're up to Yeah, next? absolutely. So mentorloop.com um, and then, uh, of course, um, yeah, LinkedIn's the best way to reach out to me, uh, Lucy Lloyd. Um, and yeah, it's uh, been lovely speaking to you too, Georgie. And, and likewise, congratulations on all you've achieved. And I guess the um, 
the you know the goodness and inspiration and things you're putting out into the world with with the work that you're doing, um, particularly for you know female representation and, and equity. Uh, so yeah, bravo to you. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. Perhaps we'll get you at one of our events, our sister club events, speaking about your journey and things because we need more women in tech, we need more tech founders and you are a walking, talking example of that. So thank you so much for being on today and thank you everyone who's listened to today's podcast. I hope you've got a lot from it. Thank you.